One of the problems I have with this part of the shop where the surface grinder is going is there is no uh, readily available power. I wind up having to string extension cords over. And I really don't want to do that. And in addition, I needed a place to mount uh, VFD and disconnect and a, a rack of some kind to hold the um, grinding wheels and so on. So um, this is a little slideshow. I built a little uh, short wall, four feet long and nine feet high. Drop power in it and I'll, uh, it's, it's got plywood on it so I can mount things anywhere I want without having to look for a stud. Anyway, it's got uh, two feeds coming from the breaker box. Uh, each one has its own circuit. Uh, one of them is a fourplex, uh, 120 volt for just running lights and things like that. The other one is uh, 220 volts coming in to, through the disconnect into a VFD, and uh, the VFD is basically just used to, to uh, convert to three phase. And uh, then there's the three phase wiring. Uh, down to some sockets to uh, plug in the, the uh, grinder and possibly a, an air handler and also uh, a remote control cable to turn it on and off from the grinder. Well, back at the uh, surface grinder again, getting ready to prepare it to reassemble. <coughs> to, took it off the assembly, meaning I took the table off to prevent it from bouncing around on the uh, uh, cross slide and the uh, took the whole thing off of the stand just to make it more portable. Anyway, uh, while I was kind of cleaning things and looking things over and all that, I uh, got to looking at the wiring that was in there. And uh, there's an example of what I found. Get that up close enough you can see. Uh, there we go. Uh, several wires were cracked like that. They all had terminals on them, but as I took them apart, some of the terminals came off. Um, there's another one here. It looks like uh, three of the terminals made it, one of them didn't. You can see the, the wires there are just as found. I mean, they were sitting there like that inside the enclosure. So, uh, the way it was wired, this uh, this switch here, this switch here was in the uh, in the frame. I'll show you in a minute here when I go to pull the wire in. It's a three-pole single throw switch, and basically you got uh, line power coming in, uh, coming in these three terminals, and then the uh, three uh, legs of the three phase going out to the uh, uh, motor. And in between, one of the legs, uh, or one pair here, had a, an extra terminal on them that uh, this lead hooked to. And this is a 240 volt connection for the, uh, the Bijou oil pump. And it's a single phase, so it only needed you know, one leg of it. <coughs> the other leg. Uh, the, the other three came into this box, which had a, uh, a four-prong socket or receptacle on it, and then from there it went up to the motor. And the purpose of this was to have the, uh, the power to the dust collector come off of it, so when you energized off of this switch, everything came on at once. Um, I, I think I'll probably go back to that, but just kind of in review here. The uh, dust collector is currently in its own socket on the power there. It comes into the end of the area in that little shorty wall I made. And the VFD up on top there is going to run it all. <coughs> now the VFD has remote control capabilities like they all do. And uh, get framed a little better there. There we go. So uh, the, uh, as you can see, the, the dust collector is plugged into its own socket there. I, I have the option of doing that, but I, I probably will go ahead and get all the sockets and plugs the same type and change, change out what's in this, uh, this little box here that goes on the back of the surface grinder. 
and then I can plug them all back together again and run them all from the same switch. A um, couple problems I ran into, uh, the, the VFD is kind of noisy, uh, not crazy noisy, but the less noise the better. So I added this disconnect and I think you can probably hear that thing whirling along. And especially when I'm making, so especially when I'm making videos, it would be better if I didn't have that running all the time I was in the shop. So I did add that disconnect for it. Um, I'm going to add uh, a, a remote cable to start and stop it. And I'll use this switch. And all I really need is one terminal, uh, you know, 1A to 1B. It's a signal to this thing to run. I'm not going to use most of the functions of this. Uh, it had uh, default from the factory, had a five second ramp up and ramp down time for the motor and all that. Um, it's going to, I, I cut that back to a two second ramp up and I don't even really know I need that. But um, I will also, uh, I turned off the ramp down time. You can just disconnect and let it, let, let it coast to a stop. Uh, it has speed control, um, you have a little potentiometer you can hook onto three of these terminals and then, or you can use the one on the panel uh, to dial in the speed. But uh, again, I don't want to control the speed on this. I want them to run full bore. So that uh, function is going to be discontinued. There is a static speed selection on there and I set that as the default and set it at 60 cycles. So everything will, or 60 hertz now, but anyway, everything will run uh, at 60 hertz uh, like it's supposed to. And, and uh, uh, the, you know, this function is really to convert uh, from single phase to three phase and turn things on and off. That's pretty much it. So uh, I'm going to get into the wiring here in a second and uh, we'll be back with you. I did finally get all the wiring finished and uh, I had it all finished except for the control and now uh, I have a little box I got from Mauser Electronics wired into the appropriate terminals here and big old cable spliced onto it so now when I hit the uh, go button it goes Okay, we're ready to put the rest of this together. There's three holes on the back where the wires used to come out. One of them went to the power. One of them went to the uh, the uh, little beager pump, and the other one went up to the motor. Yeah, we don't need to do as much of that now because everything's going to be controlled. Okay, there's there's the other end of the connector that goes on the beager pump. Okay. Okay. Okay, that one started. Alrighty, now we get around to the back here and put the strain relief on. And this part of it is all done and we're in a position now where we can put the uh, machine back in the uh, 
kit in the, on the case on the uh, stand. It takes a little bit of force to get those in there. I'm gonna switch back around the front of you here. Like so. Strain release in. We're ready to move, mount this thing back on the uh, on the stand. Well, the day has come for us to start putting the uh, the Harig uh, 612 surface grinder back together. Are the wiring's all done? We'll get a video of that later. But uh, one of the things I want to check out before we put the table back on is that the lube system's working okay and the spindle's working okay. And uh, spoiler alert, I've already checked this out. This is just for the video. So uh, I get back over in there so I can turn it on. <clears throat> What I'm looking for here is that there's uh, oil coming up out of here and then before I get too far down the road I want to put a little layer of oil on the ways and then we'll set the uh, top, carefully set that back on and then we'll wire it, we'll restring the cable that moves it back and forth. So it's starting to oil so we know the oiler is working and nothing's plugged up there's three oiler holes and they're all they're all doing their thing. And this is the recirculating system, so the oil drops back down these return ports, back into the sump, and it's cranked around up again. There's a filtration system in it, and there's a sight glass so you can see when you're uh, circulating oil. I got my buddy Mark with me here today because there's no way in the world I can put this thing gently on this by myself. So, uh, just gonna grab a hold of this and flip it over and set it gently down on top of the ways. There's plenty of room outside of there for our fingers back here. Right. You ready? I'm in. Okay, we're down on the ways. It has to be leveled yet. There we go. Okay, so here's the, the mechanism. And uh, just crank the crank there. Just crank the crank so we can see it. Okay, let's see, that's, uh, that's that end of it. And over here you can see there's a little turnbuckle or a, a eye and a adjustment for the cable tension. Okay, what you see here is the uh, lubrication oil pump. One of the first things I noticed is that the uh, oil was going everywhere. And so I got reading up on it and it said to uh, adjust this valve right here, just a half a turn open. Well, it was about three turns open, so I closed it back down to half a turn. And it says if you're still having trouble with it leaking oil everywhere, uh, to cut it back to a third, and I, it, it is still putting out a little too much oil, so I'm going to uh, dial it back to about a third of a turn. We'll put the lid back on it, we'll kind of watch it to make sure it's still oiling okay and uh, that it's not dribbling so bad.
Okay, got you handheld here so you can see uh, inside the cabinet. And uh, got my coffee can in there. And if you look up above there, you'll see an oil hole. There's a kind of a, I don't know, a catchment above it underneath the, uh, the mill itself, or the uh, grinder itself. And that little hole either was there from the factory or it was uh, added. But uh, that's how I know I got excess oil, is there's oil running out of there and into my coffee can. <coughs> well, I decided I'd do a little, uh, just a simple little job. The surface grinder came with this light. It has a big old long cord on it, and I fished it out from halfway down the room where I bought it. And uh, it was clamped to uh, a piece of... Um, pegboard on a frame up above the surface grinder. I don't have that in this situation, but I'd like to use the light. And I'm looking at uh, right here, and this looks like it ought to be used for a light. It's a, po it's a hole with a thumb screw to lock it. And the lamp has a little clamp on it. And it's built into it. Doesn't look like it was added on. And it really, because the, the way the flex on the lamp works, it wants to be in this orientation. And if I clamp it here, it just sags down out of the way. So I'm going to make a little adapter to go in here. And uh, just took a piece of uh, aluminum, a uh, one inch thick aluminum stock, cut off two and a half inch square. And then uh, figured out where I want the center of the post to go down into here. Marked that with a punch just so I could keep track of it. And then uh, just use the bandsaw to cut off whatever I wasn't going to use. I also, before I cut it off, I kind of squared up the ends, uh, got it down to size and everything. So the last remaining task is to, uh, or two tasks, is to uh, clean up this surface here and turn uh, around that fits in this hole centered on that little pip there. Uh, like I was showing you before, I got a little pip on here is where I want the center to be. I've got uh, the piece just roughly set up in the fore jaw, nothing's tight. Got a couple of pieces of bar stock in there to kind of support the back of it. And what I want to do is uh, what I want to do is loosen up this end here and this end here so I can line this thing up in general and then I can snug up the there we go okay got those two pieces in there I'm just lining it up by hand here got that right there lock it down then I'm going to gently snug up all the slack out of it here. And that's holding it against these parallels, so. Okay, yeah, that's pretty good there. Just gently snugging it. Okay, I'll give her a little more. And that should put me very close to the center. Of that pip. We're ready to rock and roll. Guess I'll retrieve my parallels there and get them put away. Now I've got to uh, real quick measure that hole. So I don't know what diameter to turn it to. 
the hole is 585 in diameter. And uh, this is clamped down pretty good. We'll get ourselves a cutter and go for it. Get the furthest piece, piece with the most protrusion out here so I can get an idea. I'm going to go with the cutter, that'll do it. Okay, here we go. While we're out here banging away on these corners, I'm going to take fairly light cuts, maybe 20 thousandths or so. This is going to take a while, so I'm going to stop the camera and just move ahead. Okay, we're down to taking a full cut now. No, no more interrupted cuts. Got a little bit more to go. Another 20 thousandths to get us close, and then we'll measure it and uh, take the final pass. That should leave us about 30 over. That's why we measure. It's 28 over. I'm measure it one more time. Just yeah, I think a 29 there. So. So I'm going to take a 15 thousandths finishing cut and at the same time I'm going to go in and uh, turn this out so I get start getting rid of that uh, shoulder there. Let's slow our feed down. finish. I'm going to re-zero my dial so when I come back in on I don't have to remember exactly where I was. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Five eighty three, five eighty five is the target. That'll leave it a slightly loose fit, which is perfect. Okay, now let's back out here. Okay, we'll start out with a cut across there.
screw it up a little bit here on the end. for it a little bit. And that looks like a halfway decent finish there. We'll break these edges and uh, put it to work. What I didn't uh, figure out until too late is this edge here interferes a little bit with the uh, where that boss that comes off from the spindle, the, the guard, runs up against the guard. There's a radius in there, so I need to actually chamfer this back a little bit. Okay, I got my little chamfering tool set up. I just got this at, a, at an estate sale or a shop closing sale or something. Anyway, I'm uh, going to have to give it a try here. Okay, we got uh, our bracket or adapter, whatever you want to call it, set in there. A little bit of deburring on it in the meantime. Turn the set screw around the right way. Don't really need the knob out here. I don't plan to take it off, so it'll be a permanent fixture. Tighten that up so it doesn't rotate either. Well, that's going to work perfect. Perfect range of motion, everything in here. Tighten it up real good. Okay, I like it. Well, I should have started video on this right when I was starting the job. I didn't like where the service, the uh, surface grinder was pointed, um, the discharge end of the wheel when it was facing this direction was uh, throwing the sparks up against the, the spark catcher at the end of the table there but it was also aiming it right at the vfd and and the electrical outlets and all that and i thought you know i could turn this around yeah here by myself which is kind of the norm 
And uh, so I have a bunch of uh, one inch pipe here. I'm going to start uh, rolling it around. And actually, uh, once you have it up on the pipes, and I just use my little uh, uh, four ton uh, porta power there to lift one end up, slide the bars under. Then I use a bar or that thing uh, as needed to continue moving the the uh, rollers around. So uh, let's get some gloves on and finish turning this thing around. couple other items. Um, one is uh, I need to uh, resurface the plate uh, of the uh, mag chuck. It's got some bad spots in it, grooves and scratches and things. Um, one of the things that I read is for us beginners is don't try to uh, grind the surface of your plate until you've gotten a little bit of uh, wheel time with this thing. and. Uh, it uh, you, you feel real comfortable because it's a it's kind of a squirrely thing to do. It's got the the hard bars that pass the magnetism, and then there's a, a softer material in between, aluminum or something else like that, uh, that tends to plug up the wheels. And you have to get a rhythm where you, you're confident that the, the thing is going to move. Uh, you can move it at the pace needed to keep it from loading up the wheels before you get to the one pass made across the plate. Then you need to, uh, of course, go back and clean your wheel up and start over again until you get you know, all down. It's, it's got quite a bit of damage to it. There's several little low spots and nicks. And not that I wouldn't add a few of my own, but I'd like to start out with a clean slate. So um, the other thing that I'm going to have to do to it is figure out, and I haven't done it yet, but I need to figure out where, where I can put a uh, a magnetic place where I can put a, a magnetic base or something uh, for a dial indicator, test indicator, so I can, you know, check things, dial them in on the, on the uh, chuck and things like that. Well, thanks for watching, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you uh, enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you enjoyed the channel, uh, please subscribe. And until we get another one ready for you, uh, happy trails.